Wow. Wow. My friends, it is so good to be back in Tucson, Arizona. It is, it is so good to be back in Tucson, Arizona. And in just two weeks' time, or as we used to say in the Marine Corps, 13 days and a wake up, we're going to make Donald Trump the next president of the United States, and it's going to start right here in Arizona. Now, we have some great dignitaries. You guys have some great local leadership. I want to give them a shout out before we get started. We've got chairwoman of the Arizona G GOP, Gina Swaboda. Where's Gina at? Hey, Gina, thank you. Gina and I get along very well, even though I pronounce Gina's name differently every single time that I see her. Gina, I'm so sorry. I will, by the end of this election, we will figure it out, but only if we win Arizona by five points. So that's, that's the challenge. I'm so thrilled to have President of the National Border Patrol Council, Paul Perez. Paul, where are you at? There we go. Paul and his agents are doing a hell of a job, despite the fact that Kamala Harris is a disaster. Let's win to give Paul Perez the leadership that this country deserves, some real border security with Donald J. Trump. And we've got the Vice President of the National Border Patrol Council, Art Del Cueto. Art, thank you so much, man. It's good to see you. Think about it. We, 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 these guys are doing such a good job keeping us safe. They're doing such a good job despite the fact that the Vice President of the United States is their border czar and is committed to open borders. Don't we need to give these people a president who fights for them instead of fighting against them? And that's what Donald Trump is going to do. Now, let's talk just a little bit about, about Kamala Harris, shall we? And I... Now, I, I've, got, I've got the easiest job in American politics, if you think about it. Because all, all, Jesus is Lord, thank you, ma'am. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. It'd be good to have a vice president not afraid to say that. But look, here's the thing. I got the easiest job in politics because all that I have to do is go out and remind the American people that Donald Trump was the president of peace and prosperity. That's a pretty damn easy job to do. We just got to talk about the fact that when Donald Trump was president, take-home pay was rising faster than it had in a generation. When Donald Trump was president, inflation was a low 1.5%. And when Donald Trump was president, the border was secure. That's a hell of a record to run on. And that's the Donald Trump record. Now, I honestly feel bad. I'm probably the only person in the room that feels bad for Governor Tim Walz. And I, I think that reaction suggests that I'm right. I'm the only person that feels bad for Governor Tim Walz. Because think about it, if I've got the easiest job to do in American politics, he's got the hardest job in American politics. He's got to go around and convince the American people that Kamala Harris is somehow going to solve the very problem she has been creating over the last three and a half years. That's a tough job. If you're the praying type, I suggest maybe you say a prayer for Tim Walz because here's, here's what Tim Walz has to do. He has to somehow pretend that Kamala Harris didn't open the American southern border, but she did. He has to pretend that Kamala Harris didn't cast trillions of dollars in new spending, which is why groceries and housing are unaffordable in the state of Arizona and across our country. Tim Walz has to try to convince people that Kamala Harris actually has ideas in her head for how to govern the United States of America. And I think all of us, all of us with common sense, when we see Kamala Harris say things like on day one, she's gonna tackle the affordability crisis affecting American families. A lot of us are saying, Kamala, 
Day one was 1,400 days ago. What the hell have you been doing the whole time? Go do your job. Stop talking about how you're going to do your job. Now, I will say in Kamala's defense, look at this. Look at me being bipartisan. I'm being nice to Tim Waltz. I'm being nice to Kamala Harris. In Kamala's defense, I think that every time she does an interview, we gain about 100,000 votes. So, so, so Kamala, keep on doing those interviews, whether they're softballs or not. And I don't know if you've seen some of the softball interviews that she, she does, but um, you know, the problem, I know we have some baseball fans in the room, right? We've got some baseball fans. The problem with a softball interview is that you still got to be able to hit a softball. And I don't know if Kamala Harris could hit a t-ball based on what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And now, now we joke about this, but actually the joke is on us because this is not just a person who's bad at doing interviews. This is a person who doesn't have the competence or the skills to be president of the United States. And I think in just two weeks, Arizona is going to send Kamala Harris a message. Go back to San Francisco where you belong. We're making Donald Trump the next president. Now let's just talk about the economy for a little bit, and then I want to talk about the open border of Kamala Harris. Because of course in Tucson, we've got the biggest, some of the biggest problems with the open border that we've had anywhere in our country. But think about, think about how bad the inflation and affordability crisis has gotten under Kamala Harris's leadership. We've got average Arizona families are spending $1,000 more a month today to buy what they could have bought when Donald Trump was president. We've got Arizona families that are paying 55% more for housing and rent today than they were when Donald Trump was president. And we've got a lot of Arizona families that are paying 25% higher prices for groceries than when Donald Trump was president. Now this is because we departed from some very common sense economic principles and I think it's important to compare the record and the plans of Donald Trump against Kamala Harris. Now, the biggest reason that we've got runaway affordability problems is because Kamala Harris has waged war on American energy. Think about this. If, if the truck driver who's bringing the groceries to the grocery store is paying 45% more for diesel, then all of us are paying more for groceries. If the truck driver who's delivering the lumber to the construction site is paying 50% more for gas, then all of us are paying more for housing. So Kamala Harris wants to wage war on American energy. Donald Trump's plan is very simple. Drill, baby, drill. Unleash American energy and you'll lower prices for American consumers. Now there's another thing that Kamala Harris, she's got her economic plan totally upside down. She'll say that she wants, and I've never seen a politician in my life, even the ones who want to raise taxes, they usually lie about it, right? Kamala Harris is going around bragging about the fact that she is going to undo the Trump tax cuts and raise taxes by millions and billions of dollars on working families. And then she wants to give money to foreign corporations that ship our jobs overseas. Well, well isn't, that, isn't there something wrong with that? Here, here's the Donald Trump approach. We're going to lower taxes for working Americans, and we're going to penalize the companies that are shipping jobs overseas, not reward them. You know, Kamala Harris, she wants to impose so many regulations on our workers, on our businesses. They, there have been hundreds of billions of dollars of additional regulations that have nothing to do with clean water or clean air. Donald Trump and I, we believe in clean air and clean water. We also believe that we can have a growing economy while protecting our workers and protecting the jobs that they do. And that's a big difference. And perhaps the biggest difference of all is that Kamala Harris came into office bragging that she wanted to open the American southern border. She came into office bragging about undoing all of Donald Trump's border policies. You know what Donald Trump thinks we ought to do? Build that wall, finish that wall, and send illegal aliens back home, not to the United States of America.
Now, there, there is this crazy thing that Kamala Harris keeps saying. And, and, you know, if you think of her campaign, if you pay attention to their campaign, she never talks about how she's going to lower grocery and housing prices for American citizens because she doesn't have any plans to do it. And most importantly, she's made the problem worse over the last three and a half years. She'll never talk about how she's going to be, bring peace and stability back to the world with her foreign policy because she's been in office for three and a half years and the world is on fire right now. So every time they ask her a question, every time they put a microphone in front of Kamala Harris and they ask her what she's going to do, she'll say, well, I grew up in a middle class family. <laughs> or, or increasingly what she'll say is she'll talk about Donald Trump. And, I, and the, the audacity for a person who's been in power for three and a half years blaming Donald Trump for her failures, I'd like to have a president who takes some responsibility for themselves and their leadership, and that's not Kamala Harris. So I, I want to talk about something that hasn't gotten much news coverage, and, and it's connected to this border issue. And I, I want to I just... I want to name this, this family and this young man by name because though you may not know about it because again the news media hasn't really covered it just a few days ago there was a United States Marine veteran who was killed who was killed by the Mexican drug cartels I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious I want, to, I want to tell you a little bit about this man because I just met his family I just met his brother-in-law and his father and of course they're heartbroken uh, but they they muster the courage to tell me a little bit about their son who lost his life, and I want to tell you a little bit about him. First of all, you know, I'm biased because I was in the Marines, but this is a, this is, this is a, this is a, this is a tall, good-looking guy, one of our very best, and his name was Nicholas Douglas Quetz, and he was murdered. He was visiting somebody in Mexico. They were going to do some, some beach activities. He got stopped by the Mexican drug cartels, and he lost his life. And one of the things that we have to appreciate is that what the, the cartels are doing, my friends, it's not just affecting us north of the border, it's affecting everything, north and south of the border. It's affecting a young Marine who wants to go visit a friend and spend some time on a beach. Because when we allow these cartels to get rich off of American suffering, then it destabilizes not just our communities, it destabilizes Mexico and the United States together. And yes, sometimes a lot of Mexican citizens are paying for that, but sometimes our own American citizens are paying the price for that too. Now here's what's additionally really disgraceful. This family lost their son four, I believe four days ago. Have they heard from a single elected official? Of course they haven't. Of course they haven't. Because we're led by incompetent people who don't give a damn about American citizens and that's gonna change when Donald Trump is the president of the United States. You know what else they told me is that they believe, and apparently American authorities believe, that they know, they actually have the name of the person who killed this handsome young Marine. And you know what should be happening is that a U.S. attorney ought to, ought to be filing charges against that scumbag and bringing him to the United States to face the full force of American law. So gentlemen, I, I hope to, to the family of Nicholas, I hope that by talking about this today, we brought some attention to what's going on. But here is my solemn promise to you, while you've been ignored by your own government for the last four days in the midst of this unbelievable tragedy, I promise you the Calvary is coming and when Donald Trump is president, we're going to kick the cartel's asses and we're going to do it for you and for every person in this room. Because, you know, I, 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 I appreciate that the show is support, and I, I just cannot believe that we've gotten to a point where, thanks to Kamala Harris's policies, we've turned Mexico into a narco state on our southern border. The cartels, in some ways, are more powerful than the local Mexican authorities, and that is injuring, it's killing, and it's making our citizens less safe. 
This has got to stop. You're sick of it, and I'm sick of it, and it's going to change. In two weeks, it's going to change. And I, and I just, you know, to, to, to the American voters, especially those that are watching at home, think about what Kamala Harris actually thinks about us. If she's talking not about young Marines losing their lives, if she's talking not about how to reimpose border security, she's not talking about how to make groceries more affordable. She's talking about Donald Trump, and she's going around and, cha and, and campaigning with washed up politicians like Liz Cheney. She's betting on all of us being dumb. And you know what Donald Trump and I are betting on? We're betting on all of the American people being smart and patriotic and kicking Kamala Harris to the curb, which is exactly where she belongs. Now, I, I just say this, but, you know, it, I, I watched this event with Kamala Harris. Remember a couple months ago, the media was all focused on how Kamala Harris, she was the candidate of joy. The candidate of joy. Well, we've got all the joy in this room right now in the Trump events. We're having a good time, and we're going to have a better time on November 5th. But, you know, they, they did this event with Kamala Harris, and she's basically whining at the people at the, the – it wasn't a rally. I don't think they had that many people there, frankly. But she's whining at people for thinking that Donald Trump is funny. And she's like, how, how dare you have a sense of humor, and when a guy cracks a joke, you actually laugh at it. The joy is gone from the Kamala Harris campaign, my friend. She's mad at us for thinking that our president, who does have a very good sense of humor, is actually good at telling jokes from time to time. Well, I'm proud. I'm proud. I'm proud. Politics doesn't have to be dull and boring. Sometimes you can have a good time. And I think Donald Trump recognizes that better than anybody. But watching her up there complaining at her fellow citizens for laughing at jokes, all I could think about was she doesn't come across as a president. She comes across as a vice principal who's very disappointed. She's very, my friends, she's very disappointed in us. She's very disappointed that we laugh at jokes from time to time. She's very disappointed that we want to pay lower prices for groceries and housing. She's very disappointed that we want to close down southern border. And she's very disappointed that in two weeks we're going to tell Kamala Harris, you're fired, get the hell out of Washington, D.C. Okay, now here's what we're going to do. I'm going I'm to make one more point, and then I'm going to take some questions from the reporters, and then we'll have to wrap up and hit the road. I think we're headed to Nevada today, um, and then we'll do some events there, and then we'll head back to the, to, to the East Coast, where we'll be campaigning in, in Georgia, North Carolina, and then in the Midwest. So we're, we're, we're getting around, ladies and gentlemen. We're having a good time doing it. But the, the, the final message I want to leave you all with is we're going to win this race, but only, only if we get out there and vote. All, all of this politic and all these rallies, all these media interviews, all the fun that we're having, it's not going to amount to anything unless we get our friends and family out there to the polls. And so I want to make three requests of you. Number one, there's a website that we built called SwampTheVoteUSA.com, and I'll repeat it, SwampTheVoteUSA.com. You can check your registration. You can check how to get a mail-in ballot if that's what you want to do. You can check your polling location. You can check how to get involved in our efforts in these final two weeks to get out the vote and make sure that we actually win this race. Because if we all get out there and vote, we're going to win this race, and Donald Trump's going to be the President of the United States. That's a pretty damn good thing. Sorry. That's number one. Number one is SwampTheVoteUSA.com. Number two, while I'm taking reporters or now or you can do it, you know, whatever makes sense, we'll be here for another 15 minutes or so, take out your phone, take a photo of this rally, take a photo of, of yourself and your friends and your family, post it on social media or text it to your friends and tell them why you're voting for Donald Trump for president. We're never going to have Kamala Harris and her corporate media allies tell the truth about this campaign or about this movement, but you know who can tell the truth? 
every single person in this room, and if we tell the truth, we win. That's the second request I want to make of you. And the third request is I want every person in this room to get out there and vote 10 times. Now I can see some of you are like, we're, we're, we're in Tucson, not Maricopa County. We only vote once down here. But we're going to vote in Maricopa County and here in Tucson, we're going to vote 10 times the legal way. And that means taking yourself to the polls and get nine of your friends and family, get them to the polls, make sure they vote the right way, and that's how we take this country back. So with that, I will say thank you, Arizona. Thank you for all your hard work. Let's get across the finish line and make Donald Trump the next president and take this country back. God love you. Thank you so much. We'll take some questions from reporters, but I'm so thrilled to be here. All righty. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, let's start with the local reporters. We'll get to the national folks if we got a little time. Semper Fi. God bless you, sir. Hello, hello, Senator Vance. My name is Renee Romo. I'm a reporter with 13 News here in Tucson. Thank you so much for taking questions. Um, my question to you is just as you were talking about your ticket's economic plan, um, former President Donald Trump has said that he would impose high tariffs on uh, Chinese goods sure. if he were to take office. Um, However, a number of economists has, have said that that would increase the prices of foreign goods here in America. Um, what do you say to any voters that are concerned about this? Yeah, Renee, I, I think, look, it's, it's a fair question. It's an important question. But the very same people who said that Donald Trump's tariffs aren't going to work are the very same people that said that we should let China into the World Trade Organization. They were wrong about that. They're the very same people that said it would lead to more American prosperity if we shipped all of our industries and manufacturing base to China, and they were wrong about that. And they're the same people that have led to the evisceration of the American middle class, and they were wrong about that. Donald Trump and I are going to rebuild the American middle class, and we're going to do it by fighting back against the Communist Chinese Party. Now here, here's what's so important about this, Renee, is look, th think about this. If you take two factories and two sets of workers, in America, we want those factory workers to have good middle class jobs. We want them to be able to support a family and buy a home with those good middle class jobs. In China, they're willing to pay their people, sometimes literal slaves, literal slaves, $3 a day. And you ask yourself, well, if they're going to make it for $3 a day and we want to pay our people good middle class wages, how do we fight back against it? And the way that we fight back against it is to say, if you want to bring that slave labor made crap back into our country, you're going to pay a big fat tariff. And that's how we're going to protect American businesses and American workers. And the one, the one final point, the reason I don't put too much stock, in the, and, and by the way, there are plenty of experts that think that Donald Trump's economic plan is the way to recreate prosperity in this country. I think Donald Trump is going to unleash a golden age of opportunity and the American dream in this country. We got to get there first, of course. But those same people, you know what they always, the people who say they don't like Donald Trump's economic plans, they ignore the fact that Donald Trump put big fat tariffs on China during his first administration. And inflation was the lowest it had been in 40 years and take home pay was going up. So. My response to people who criticize Donald Trump's economic plans is the proof is in the pudding. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Because I think for most Arizonans, they're saying no. So let's change directions. Let's go back to the policies that worked. Let's go back to Donald J. Trump's presidency. Thank you, ma'am. Next hi. question. Oh, hi, Senator Vance. I'm Samantha Califa from the Tucson Spotlight. Uh, in the past, you've been very clear about your views on women and uh, abortion and women's health care. Um, what are your uh, plans to support women if you make it to the White House? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Look, I, I, I grew up 
in a family um, where we also often didn't have a lot of money. In fact, most of the time didn't have a whole lot of money. And I grew up in a neighborhood, frankly, where I saw a lot of young women who chose to terminate a pregnancy because they felt like they didn't have any options. And what Donald Trump and I believe is that we want as many American families to have as many children as they want to. And the best way to do that is to give young women more options. Don't make them feel like there's only one choice out there. Let's promote a true pro-family country. Let's make... We, 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 we want to make, you know, for folks who need it, we want to make fertility more accessible. For young families who go to the hospital, they have a beautiful baby and they come home to surprise medical bills, we need to cut that crap out. There are a lot of things that we can do to make it a more affordable and more possible for American families to choose life. And that's certainly what I want to happen. I want more American families to have babies, to have beautiful, healthy families. Because if we don't have families in this country, then what the hell's the point of it, right? We want to raise our families in a healthy and prosperous country. And if you don't have children, you don't have the next generation. So Donald Trump and I are committed to being pro-family, pro-woman, pro-baby, and we're going to make it happen when we get back to the White House. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, Senator. My name is Natalie Robbins from the Tucson Sentinel. Um, so when your running mate Donald Trump was here in Tucson, he planned to launch one of the largest mass deportations in our history. Note to self, I'd like to have a drink or whatever you all had before you came to this rally. Me we're, too. we're having a good time. A ask your question, ma'am. Sorry. Um, Senator, I'm curious if your administration plans to deport um, DACA recipients or childhood arrivals. Look, ma'am, I, I think that what we've said and what President Trump has said is that when you've got 25 million illegal aliens in this country, you've got to deport a lot of people or you don't have a border anymore. It's just, it's just that simple. Now, like, look, you, you also, of course, we got to focus on the most hardened criminals. Thanks to Kamala Harris's policies, we've got 425,000 violent criminal illegal aliens in this country right now. That's, we mentioned the U.S. Marines, that's more than double the size of the United States Marine Corps. We got to get those people out of our country and we've got to do it as quickly as humanly possible. But. Look, we, we also have to deport people, not just the bad people who came into our country, but people who violated the law coming into this country. We've got to be willing to deport them. And I think, I think by the way, of course, you can be humane about this, you can be compassionate about this, but I completely reject the argument that Kamala Harris's open border, which has led to 320,000 missing children, that is that is that has led to 11 and 12 year old girls being sex trafficked by Mexican drug cartels. That is not compassionate. Having a border is compassionate for American citizens and for everybody else too. Ne next question. Senator Vance, John Washington, when Arizona Luminaria, a, a related question here. Um, so, would you consider also re-implementing the family separation crisis? When you talk about closing down borders, would that also include potentially ending uh, the refugee program? Well, look. Well, there's so so a couple things there. First of all, there's not one refugee program, right? We have multiple different refugee programs, and the problem is that Kamala Harris has granted mass asylum and mass parole. That was never what these programs were meant for. Now, we're not talking about a guy who, you know, worked with, with, with American troops 
and is a, is a good person, has been properly vetted, and you handle those cases on a case-by-case -case basis, we're talking about Kamala Harris giving legal status to millions of millions of people. That's illegal. It's also disgraceful and is one of the reasons why we have probably thousands of terrorists in this country right now is because she's not doing her job. Now, the, the, the second question here is, it, I find that the, even the premise of the question a little unusual because you talk about are you going to re-implement child separation? Well, the Department of Homeland Security has said they've effectively lost 320,000 children. Now, some of them hopefully are at home with their families, but we know that a lot of them have been sex trafficked. A lot of them have been used by drug mules. The true family separation policy is Kamala Harris's open border, and Donald Trump is going to change that. Next question. Good afternoon, Senator Vance. My name is Mareli Ruiz. I'm with Univision Arizona. My question to you is, right now you mentioned that in the next two weeks you were going to change the situation with Mexico and their cartels. How are you planning on doing that? Well, what, what I said, and it, it, maybe I misspoke, but I don't think that I did. Um, what I said is that over the next couple of weeks, we all need to work to apply pressure on the cartels who murdered this innocent young Marine and try to put pressure on Kamala Harris to do something about it. Because for the next two weeks, she's the one in power. Donald Trump and I ultimately can't change anything. But in two weeks, when the fine people in this room make Donald Trump the president-elect of the United States of America, ma'am, here's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to stop using the People's Department of Justice against the American citizens, and we're going to start using the Department of Justice against the Mexican drug cartels. And here's... And here's the other thing. I think we've got hundreds of thousands of very fine Marine soldiers sailors and airmen who are pretty pissed off at the Mexican drug cartels. I think we'll send them to do battle with the Mexican drug cartels too. We'll, we'll do one more question, then I'll leave you all with a final thought, and then we'll have to hit the road. Thank you all. Hello, Senator J.D. Vance, Kenny Darwin with KGUI9. I just wanted to ask, we have an opioid uh, pr problem in this country, specifically with fentanyl. And since moving yes, to Arizona, I've talked to many parents, loved ones who have lost loved ones to fentanyl. What is the federal government's role in addressing the issue? And how exactly do we combat that issue, especially for a state like Arizona, where most, if not all, of that fentanyl is coming through our border? Yeah. Well, let me say, let me say a couple things. F first of all, this is a humanitarian catastrophe that should be the biggest story in every national news media story and interview. They want to talk about 2020. They want to talk about something that happened six years ago. They ought to be talking about the fact that 100,000 of our people, many in the prime of their lives, are dying. It is a disgrace, and Donald Trump is going to do everything that he can to fight it. That is, that's where we're going to start. Now, you ask how. How do you do that? Look. The number one reason why we have so much fentanyl in the state of Arizona, but also all over our country, it's, 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 we got to talk about it. This crap is manufactured in China because it's tough to manufacture, and then it's brought into the United States of America by the Mexican drug cartels. You need to have a president who goes to China and tells them what's what, stop manufacturing this crap, and then you need to have a president who sends the U.S. military to battle with the Mexican drug cartels. Get this poison out of our country. That's what we got to start with. Now, here, here's, here's the second thing, and I, I, I know this very personally. Back home in Ohio, I know a lot of folks, especially a lot of folks engaged in Christian ministry who are trying to help people in recovery take that first step out of addiction, whether that's a detox facility where they get clean for 48 hours and they can go into bigger treatment, or whether that's setting up you know, Christian-based, religious-based 
ministries to, to, to deal with people and to help people who are dealing with addiction, we need to make it easier for folks in their communities to provide treatment to the people who need it. And unfortunately, right now, we've got a federal government that's making it harder on Christian ministry. We need to make it easier on everybody. Whether you're a Christian or not, if you want to help people, Donald Trump is going to be your friend in the Oval Office. So, so on, on, that, on, that note, on that note, let's let, let me just give you some sense of the stakes here. And again, we got to get out there and vote. That's the most important thing. We've got to get out there and vote, and we've got every opportunity to do it. You got mail-in voting, you got early voting, you got election day voting. Look, I I I don't like election season. I like election day, but as Donald Trump says, it is what it is. We've got to use the tools available to us to get out there and vote because if Kamala Harris's team is using everything and we're only voting on election day, then we're going to lose. So use every avenue you can to get people to the polls and to get yourself to the polls too. That's what we got to do. But I, I'd, I, I'd ask you to just think a little bit about the stakes here because look, I want to win this election as much as anybody in this room, and we are going to win this election. And it is going to be very fun, I will tell you, it's going to be very fun on November the 5th to beat Kamala Harris and the Democrats. It will be. But, but the point is not just to beat Kamala Harris and the Democrats. The point is to beat them so that the American people can have the government that actually serves their interests and fights for their values and for their futures. That's what this is all about. Now, we've got a young Marine who lost his life at the hands of the Mexican drug cartels. And I, 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 when, when his family was telling me this story, you know what I was thinking in the back of my mind? I was thinking about when I sat next to a DEA agent, a drug enforcement agent, on a plane, and he told me that in the last few years, the Mexican cartels have gone from making about a billion dollars a year to over $15 billion a year. And that was a couple years ago. It's probably, Border Patrol folks, it's probably a hell of a lot higher now than it is than it was two years ago. When we enrich criminal gangs because of the policies of Kamala Harris, it comes back home. And sometimes it comes back home in the most tragic way. Let's tell you another person I met on the campaign trail just a few weeks ago, a woman who's about, you know, probably 65, 70. She had recently been retired. Her husband, was about to retire, and they were raising their grandchildren because her daughter had died of a fentanyl overdose. And you know what she told me? She said that for 40 years, in good times and in bad times, they had a little tradition that they did every Friday night. Her and her husband would do steak night. And I'm not talking about going to a fancy steakhouse. I'm talking about going to the grocery store and grilling some steaks at home. And I know all of us realize it's those little rituals, those are the things that actually make life worth living, right? A steak night with your loved ones on a Friday night, that's why we work, and that's why we love this country. But you know what? She stopped doing steak night about a year ago. And she stopped doing steak night because it was so expensive, the groceries were too high, that she gave up on this thing that had brought her and her family meaning and joy for 40 years. What we're doing, my friends, is not just beating Kamala Harris and the Democrats. What we're doing is creating a country where young Marines don't lose their lives because we've empowered the Mexican drug cartels. We're creating a country where people who work hard and play by the rules can afford a steak on a Friday night because this is the United States of America, and that's what we want for our citizens. But But as we're out there working, and as we're out there getting people to the polls, and as we're out there finding ways to make sure that as many people vote for Donald Trump as possible, I just want you to remember that the American people, the people I just talked about who are suffering under Kamala Harris's leadership, they are going to thrive and prosper, but only if they have a leader who is fit to serve and fit to lead this great nation. Let's go give it to them. God bless you, Arizona. Thank you so much for having me.